A German newspaper once described him as a man with a heart, ambition and a big mouth. Wolfgang Kubicki is a lawyer, a staunch liberal in the European sense and the deputy leader of Germany's pro-business FDP party. Hello. Welcome to the DW interview. I'm Alexandra von Namen. Mr. Kubicki, the so-called Panama Papers have caused a major stir. They show how the rich and powerful use tax havens and shell companies to conceal their wealth. Many people in Germany are outraged. You maintain, however, that such shell companies are necessary. Do you have one yourself? No, unfortunately not. I'm not rich enough. And even if I were, I wouldn't need to hide my wealth. But there are situations in which people wish to conceal where they keep their money. An example, a man has a child out of wedlock and wants to provide for it without making it known that he is the father. Whatever the reason, it's useful to have legal avenues that allow payment to be made to a child while the benefactor remains anonymous. Our merchant fleets employ flags of convenience too. Otherwise, German-loaned trading vessels and container ships wouldn't travel. They need to fly the flag of the relevant country. Flags of convenience require legal frameworks, so such firms have a legal foundation. Tax avoidance within a legal framework is not a crime. The arrangement only makes sense if you command a high income, though. Otherwise, it just gets too expensive. The firms might have a legal basis, but the revelations have shown that regulations are often abused. Don't you think that there should be more transparency with regard to shell companies in the future? Even if I were to call for that, it wouldn't help because we can't make Panama abide by German law. Nobody can expect the rest of the world to adopt German laws or tax regulations. Tax avoidance structures exist in Europe too. The Dutch don't have a withholding tax on royalties, so it's become a shelter for earnings from intellectual property. Tax rates on legal entities in Ireland are lower, 15% tax on capital. In Germany, it's 25 to 30 percent. The fact that companies try to relocate to the place where they pay the least tax is the price of freedom. Germany alone can't change that. Can you understand that people in Germany are angry when they see firms shoring up their money in tax havens while they pay their taxes? Yes, but but these companies are paying taxes, just lower rates, as in Ireland, for example. I'm smirking because I'm thinking of the village of Norde Friedrichskog in my state of Schleswig-Holstein. It was made up of 13 farms and I don't know, 500 cows. But until 2003, it was home to 500 big-name companies, Lufthansa, Allianz, Aon and others, which had subsidiaries located there. Why? Because the community abolished trade tax. Taxation within Germany is competitive. There are more subsidies for companies in the East than in the West. Cities or states lure companies with the promise of lower tax burdens. A German joint stock company based in Germany can be involved in criminal activities. It doesn't need to have a company in Panama for that. I think people have overreacted somewhat. It's probably true that despots and terrorists use offshore holding structures. But it's about the criminals abusing them, not the structures themselves. You work as a lawyer specializing in tax law. You have reportedly also represented tax evaders. Does that make you uncomfortable? I get asked this time and again. It's not up to me to decide. I'm not the judge. I don't have to cast moral judgment. I just need to do my job. One doesn't ask a doctor treating a terrorist whether they feel comfortable. I just have to ensure the process is in accordance with the rule of law. What do you like most about your job? 
The clients, mostly. I don't take on cases of drug-related crime. I'd also have an issue with sexual assault cases. I don't take on political cases as I'm involved in politics myself, so it could be held against me. I'm chiefly an economist. I work with numbers and a lot of my work is about evaluating. I enjoy looking at two different legal areas and then coming to, hopefully for the client, one sensible solution. But you are also a politician, the deputy chairman of the FDP. Your party has often been criticized for cozying up to business. Is this criticism justified? Not when you look at our members. We have far fewer business people than the Christian Democrats, for example. We had less contact to corporations and banks than to small and medium-sized and family businesses. I don't think it's a bad thing to use economic competence to safeguard the country's prosperity. Some politicians would be wise to think about how the money they spend is generated. Unless it prints money, the state can't ensure everything everyone has a job. So in that respect, I don't think being close to business is a bad thing. I don't hold anything against a Green Party member with close ties to environmental groups either. Clashes are to be expected. The democratic process is about making the best out of these different outlooks. After 45 years of party membership, I wish there were more people in Parliament who came from professions they knew a lot about. I think Parliament is full of people making decisions about issues without any understanding of the consequences. Evidently, voters felt differently. In the last federal elections in 2013, the FDP were booted out of Parliament for the first time ever. What did you personally learn from that? For one, that criticism of the party leadership between 2009 and 2013 was justified. We didn't lose because we were perceived as too close to business, but rather because the people who elected us in 2009 had lost confidence in the ability of party leaders to make good on their campaign promises. We went into the 2009 elections with a pledge to introduce a lower, simpler and fairer tax system. That didn't succeed. Party leaders appeared content to get their ministerial portfolios. Before the election, we'd promised to unite the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with that of Economic Cooperation and Development. Instead, both remained and were filled with FDP candidates. That gave rise to the impression that we didn't stick to our word, and our popularity began to slide right after the election. We had been at 5% or below since 2010, hence the result of the last election. So mistakes were made, but they gave rise to a debate as to whether the FDP was needed in Germany at all. Do Germans need the FDP? In my view, yes. After all, I am German and I believe we need the FDP. The fact that all opinion polls now put us at 7% is a positive sign. It shows we're on the way up. No matter where I am, I see a big demand for the Free Democrats to offer solutions to our present problems. The ill will is gone. People are flocking back. They are looking for a party that can deal with questions related to a social market economy, education, tolerance, openness and civil rights. I am very confident that we will achieve a respectable result in the 2017 federal elections. Will it be all or nothing for the FDP in the 2017 federal elections? In every election it's all or nothing. Much is in flux and after good results in the state elections, it's important the FDP does well in the federal ones. For Germany too, because if we have another four or five years without any substantial opposition party in parliament that poses important questions, how will we safeguard our prosperity? How will we develop ideas for a new Europe so the EU doesn't fall apart? We're facing a possible Brexit this June. The people will decide. We'll make them an offer and they can accept or decline.
But I'm sure we'll keep attracting people, young ones too, who want something out of life, who want to have a good outlook and not worry about domestic security issues, family policy or their old age. More and more people are attracted to the FDP and our popularity will grow, in the opinion polls and then in the election results. The FTP has just repositioned itself ahead of upcoming federal elections. It also has a new image and new leaders. How are you coping with that? I'm coping with the fact that I'm deputy leader very well. I've also come to grips with receiving almost 95% of the votes. That would have been unthinkable four or five years ago. And with the parties repositioning? There's a very good working atmosphere, not just in the executive committee or between the chairman, myself and the others. The federal executive committee's working environment is open and constructive, and when someone takes an opposing view, they're not automatically accused of acting with evil intentions. That's also part of our success. We're back on track. People see we live up to our claim that everyone has a right to voice their opinion. Previously, when the party leader said something, it was basically set in stone, as may still be the case in other parties. But a democracy that's built on the right to opposing views can't just pay lip service to freedom of expression. It must practice it too, like the FDP does. And because people see it's living up to its own noble ideals, the FDP has recovered at a speed I wouldn't have thought possible two years ago. At the end of the DW interview, we ask our guests to complete three sentences for us. For me, straight talk is... The most important thing in the world is only then do you know what someone wants and can react. A life without politics? Is something I can imagine. Not yet, but in the foreseeable future. Politics isn't everything. An honest person isn't stupid. On the contrary, he or she lays the foundations for coexistence. Mr. Kubicki, many thanks.